Thank you everyone for joining today's webinar on understanding the division of vocational rehabilitation. Today's webinar is being presented by Ann Showalter. Ann is a vocational rehabilitation counselor for the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. She graduated with her BA in psychology and sociology from UW-Madison and has a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling at UW-Milwaukee. She's worked for the DBR for 19 years. She is a licensed professional counselor and certified rehabilitation counselor. Thank you, Anna, for um, joining us today. Thanks, Katie. Um, so I'm going to start out because I'm, you know, I'm guessing there is a combination of people who maybe have been exposed to DVR, have worked with DVR, and then maybe people who are just starting the process. So the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, show a quick video um, that DVR came up with a couple years ago. To, it really is a good just start in like summary of um, what DVR is. All right. Okay. Katie, is it showing up yet? Yes, I can see it. Hopefully okay. we'll be able to hear it. Okay, let me know if it, you can't. Okay. I had a lot of things I'd wanted to do in the past. I wasn't sure what career I was going to go into. Doing all that work, feel much better. I like it so much. DVR stands for the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, part of the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development. Vocational refers to work and rehabilitation is the assistance to get you there. DVR works specifically with individuals with disabilities throughout the state. DVR believes that anyone should have the opportunity to seek integrated and competitive employment, regardless of the limitations that you might have. We believe that anyone and everyone can work. I went and I met with DVR. DVR, they made it simple for me. You don't have to go through this the rest of your life. They said, what kind of career would you like? They helped me get a career with my schooling. Once I was able to get connected with DVR and I was assigned a counselor, it was right after I just suffered a stroke in my eye. My counselor was very, very empathetic and very sensitive to what I was going through and she asked all of the right questions. DVR services are diverse and specifically tailored to each individual's needs. Services can include assistance with job searching, career counseling, career assessment, assistive technology and training. From youth to adulthood, DVR helps people with disabilities reach their employment potential. We provide the help you need based on your individual goals, interests, and abilities. DVR helps students with disabilities achieve their career goals by starting early. It is never too early to start thinking about your career. DVR is really helpful to a lot of people who go through different struggles and different disabilities and helping them with finding a job and teaching certain skills and providing any other service that they may need. Ultimately, the consumer controls the process. Uh, the DVR counselor is going to be there to facilitate it, to keep it moving forward. The DVR counselor is going to offer lots of ideas. It's our job to help you find out what your options are so that you have the information you need to make the choice that's best for you. We're always together working towards that long-term employment goal. They will find you a job. One that will work with your disabilities, one that you can grow at. DVR, beautiful thing. I don't know where I'll be in a year. I don't know where I'll be in five years, but I know that if I need DVR, I'll be able to have access to DVR. 
If you have a permanent disability that makes it difficult for you to find a job, keep a job, or get a better job, contact us to see if you're eligible. If you get a job and find out you want a better job, you can always reapply for services. DVR is here to help you, to help you reach that long-term employment goal. We're here to help you through that process. You know, we really want to focus on ability and not disability. There is a right job for you. There is an employment opportunity out there for you. Apply today and find out what it is. We can help you find that job that you're going to love. Sorry, okay. <laughs> Didn't want that to happen right away. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, I really, really like that video. I think, it, like I said, it just gives a really good um, a summary really quick about what DVR is. Um, I primarily work with high school students um, to start and I work with them through however, you know, any kind of employment, you know, um, excuse me, through school, uh, employment, you know, short-term employment, um, college, whatever it may be, and ultimately reaching their long-term job goal. Um, but we do have, you know, all ages. So people might come in at high school, they may come in in their 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, and on. Um, it really just depends on the person's need. And like it was mentioned in the video, um, there is, there's, so there's no age limit and there's no, you know, limit on how many times you apply. So maybe I work with somebody who in their high, well, they're in high school and I get them, you know, they're employed and, and they don't need any DVR anymore. Um, and then at some point again, down the road, whether it be, you know, three years, five years, 20 years, they could always come back again. So it's not whether they want to change jobs or they, you know, just want to increase or improve their job, um, advance in their job. There's really no restrictions on that. So that's really important to know that, um, People are welcome to come back as many times as, as they need to throughout the years. How young um, and is someone when they become eligible? Is there a limit on age, like how young you'll serve? So generally, we would say no younger than 14. Um, but the 10, the practice is generally about if they're in high school, it's about two years prior to graduation. So. Typically, I would see some money or get a referral from high school about junior year, maybe a little bit later if they are maybe staying till 21. It really just varies. Some people do come to me at like 16 and, and they are staying till 21 in high school. Um, but really, technically, the minimum age is, is 14. Um, but then, you know, after that, it's, you know, it, it, you have to be able to work. So that's kind of the 14 is that you know, starting point, because if you, you know, you have to be able, eligible to be able to work. Thank you. Um, so if um, somebody is trying just to apply, um, you know, I will put up some, the email for the DVR application. You can certainly always reach out to me as well. Um, or I'm sure Katie has the contact info too. Um, you can also honestly just Google DVR Wisconsin and you will find that application. Um, so that is a, a quick way to kind of pull that up if you need it. Um, I am going to share again. Let's see if I can find it here. This is if you're just starting to apply. Uh, it kind of outlines the um, process for just for the beginning. So there is a re what they call a referral. I call it application. Um, but so referral is basically the application. It's just we want to talk to the person or the parents before they actually go through the whole um, process and sign off saying, yes, I want to proceed. Um, so like I said, you can look at the application or referral application online. Um, you can call the uh, main office and request um, an application to be mailed to you. Um, 
you can stop in our office. We are open Monday through Friday, 745 to 430. Um, so there's many ways that you can obtain that, that um, referral application. Um, and then the next step that we do is what we call orientation. Um, and that is over the phone. It's just basically giving some more information about DDR, going over the referral application, making sure that every, all the information is correct um, and, and uh, any, answering any questions that might come up at that point. And um, for the referral, yeah. can anybody make a referral? Can you know a parent or a teacher, does it, does it matter how the person gets to you as long as they get to you? Yeah, so the referral is initially, so ultimately the referral can be started by anybody. And there is a section on there that will say like, who, if it's not, you know, who's referring. And there's also, if there's um, uh, somebody who needs to be contacted. So maybe even if it's not a parent, maybe it's a teacher or somebody who's helping with the application. Um, so the referral is open to anybody to refer. When it gets to the application piece, um, it has to be signed either by the consumer or the potential consumer who's applying to DDR if they're over 18 and their own guardian or a parent. So the beginning part can be by anyone, but it does have to be like signed by, like I said, the consumer or their guardian. Okay. Um, and so that's where when we go over the application, just to make sure um, that all the information is correct and that they, and on this, you know, you'll see that it says sign application. Well, since COVID happened, we kind of got away from that because we weren't seeing anybody in person. Um, and it was very difficult to do that and really delay in the process. So now we, we can do like a verbal um, signature. So if we're speaking to, like I said, the consumer who's over 18 or their guardian um, and kind of a verbal or the, you know, um, signature, so to speak. So we don't have to hold up the process of like trying to send it out and get it signed and all this stuff now. Um, so that's a little bit different from what that says. Um, and then the next piece would be um, Stout Vocational Rehabilitation Institute. Um, you know, they are part of UW Stout. They are going to process, they're going to do the actual intake. So there is a phone intake. It takes about 30 to 60 minutes. Um, they will call and schedule a time because it does take a little while um, to gather information about the potential, you know, the applicant. Um, and so there, you know, it can be um, depending on, you know, if it's a student, a lot of times it's just the parents that are maybe doing it or the guardians. It can be both. Um, really, it's up to however, you know, they want you want to handle that. Um, but basically, they're gathering information and then they're going to get information on to send out releases to obtain documentation um, to ultimately determine disability um, eligibility. Um, so if it's a student, they'll request uh, an IEP. They may also request medical documentation, things like that. So they will um, send out those releases to be able to obtain those records. Um, and then once that's completed, so the intake is done over the phone, they've obtained the records, they will draft up the eligibility. Um, DVR counselor has to be the one to approve it. So they will draft it, but like myself would have to review it, make sure it makes sense, that it looks right, um, that all the, the you know, everything is completed correctly. Um, and then I would sign off and accept that eligibility. And then if the person is eligible, they would be notified and then we would be scheduling a time to develop their plan. Um, and it doesn't really, so this piece, I'm gonna stop sharing this. Um, I'm not going to totally get into eligibility too deep. And the reason for that is there's eligibility. And so, you know, you have to have a disability and it has to be make an impediment to employment. Now, obviously, high school students may have not been working, but we utilize, you know, the information from school. There is another component to it that really is not affecting things right now. And that's considered it's called OOS or order of selection. And that would treat if we are we had a waiting list. Um, which we have had in the past, um, to manage that waiting list, it would be based on the date of application. And then this, like, uh, what do you call the severity um, of limita uh, limitations. So um, if somebody gets a letter saying they're eligible, it's going to say you're eligible, and it's going to say you're in a category one, two, or three. Category one is considered the most severe. Um, two, 
probably majority of people fall in the category two, and then there's three where either you don't have an impediment, excuse me, it's not a long-term impediment, or uh, you don't have any serious limitations, but there's some kind of impediment. So majority of people, I would say, fall in the category two, and the reason for that is when we're looking at part of that order of selection, we're looking at seven areas, mobility, communication, self-direction, interpersonal skills, work tolerance, work skills, I don't know if I forgot one, self-care. And so if we need four or more of those limitations to be serious, to be in category one, um, only one is needed for category two. So that's why a majority of people will fall into that category two. Um, that was really, a, you know, when we did have a waiting list, um, that was a big piece of it. And so we really had, you know, it was very important to know that so we could put people on the wait list correctly and, and um, serve the people with the most significant needs first. However, right now we don't have a waiting list. Um, so we still go by that order of selection, but it doesn't, there's no weight from that piece. Um, and it's, so if you see that on the application, or sorry, the um, eligibility letter, um, it's just for that order selection piece. And once that's done, it has no effect on your case after that. Um, it's just for the eligibility and the wait list. Um, you know, it has no effect on like any kind of services that somebody might need um, or anything like that. So basically, you don't have to worry about it after that it doesn't affect anything going forward. Um, so hopefully, it stays like that. And we don't have to go back to resort back to a, a waiting list. Um, and it's been quite a while since that happened. So uh, fingers crossed that, you know, we would um, not do that again. Um, so in some terms of, you know, I've gotten questions like, well, my, you know, son or daughter, or I'm in uh, category two, what does that mean? And it, it really, once it happens, it doesn't mean anything anymore. So um, they can kind of disregard it. Um, if the student, if it's a student and they're still in high school, every high school does have a DVR representative that works with that school. So when completing the application, it indicate the school and it will go to that appropriate counselor who works with that school. So myself, I receive all the students from Arrowhead and, and Kettle Moraine High School. Um, and then there's, you know, counselors assigned to the different, you know, all the rest of the high schools in the state. Um, so it just kind of streamlines things and it really makes it easier for, uh, to, you know, make the connections with the school and have contact and, and, you know, um, relationships with the school and the teachers to make things a lot, um, smoother in terms of, um, the whole, the whole process for high school students. Otherwise, if they're not a high school student, they are randomly assigned, um, to a, a counselor that works with the, what we call the adult population. And so when people are applying, do they need to make sure they send it to the um, DVR office that is closest to them or does it matter where they send it? So easiest way to apply is to do it online. And it, when you, it'll, you'll ask you where you want your application to go. So if it, you'll most likely, you know, in this area would be Waukesha County. Um, and so it will go to the Waukesha County office or Waukesha office, um, if it's a specific, like I said, if it's a specific school, it'll end up going to that specific school as well. Um, but like I said, it does ask like where you want to be served. Every once in a while, you may have an address that is not where you actually want to be finding a job. So that's where you can indicate it might be a little bit different. Um, so if you do it online, it's really easy. It'll get sent where it needs to. Um, or if you were going to do a paper one, it would go to probably your closest office um, and you can send it there. Um, so it will be assigned based on, so even within, like if there were, like Milwaukee, for example, Milwaukee County has three offices, I believe. Um, it would go to the office based on that person's address within Milwaukee County. Um, right. So you know, like Waukesha, we only have one office for Waukesha County, so it just would go there. So it really just depends on the, the county um, and how it, hit, how it, who it goes to. And then if we, I know we have several people who either have moved or have talked about moving between counties within Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, or even an Illinois person coming up from Wisconsin or to Wisconsin. 
can those obviously state to state is different, but within right. Wisconsin, is it easy to transfer a case to another DVR if you decide to move? Absolutely. So within the state, it's very easy to transfer to the office, like if, you know, whatever would end up being closest um, to, you know, the, the new location. Um, basically, you just, the person has to formally, they basically request is saying I'm moving. And so, you know, I need to move, you know, maybe have my case transferred to the, the closer office. Um, there is a, it's, so the supervisor or director of that office that they're currently at would contact the other office that they'd be transferring to and just confirm that it's going to be happening. And it's a formal process, but it's not like they're going to say no. <laughs> um, right. But it's very easy within Wisconsin. So anywhere in Wisconsin, it's very easy to transfer it. Every so every state has some form of DVR. They may not call it DVR. They may call it just VR or, or something. Um, and it does not transfer state to state. So it would have to be a reapplication. Um, certainly, if they have any information from a DVR in another state, for Illinois, for example, if they had been working in Illinois. Um, we can get those records, you know, with the appropriate releases and things like that and get that, obtain that information. But unfortunately, it's not like we can just automatically transfer it. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, this doesn't happen very often, but I would say certainly if it was like a transfer, say somebody was moving, but for whatever, you know, they're already kind of set where they're supposed to be, or they're still, they're moving, but they're still going to be working at, say they're in a job, but we're just still, you know, providing services for whatever, and they're, they're moving, but it, and it, you know, it may not make sense to transfer when it's like, we've already been working with them, nothing's really changing other than their actual address. Okay. Uh, we might, you know, there's always that case. And then if there's a student who was actually, you know, or a person who's actually going to go on to college, um, the intention we're always saying, like, generally, they're going to their home address would be we're looking at it as like the same at that point, they would stay with that current counselor and we just do long distance. Okay, um, as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to share this next one. This one just kind of talks about, um, again, the process. So once we're done with um, eligibility. So you can see on here, so it says eligibility. It does talk about the, the waiting list if we did have it. Um, then we are, um, the intake is going to, again, so when FCRA is doing the intake, they're going to ask some of those questions, you know. Um, some of those questions are going to be asked by the intake, but a lot of them are going to be part of the actual development IP. So once you get assigned to a counselor, they're going to ask things like, you know, what are, what is your job goal? What are we looking for? Um, what are the circumstances um, about, you know, again, what what maybe your thoughts on working? Do you have benefits? You know, things like that. Um, trying to get an information about um, what that person's plans are um, and, and part of like developing that, wh where their background is, where they're at at that time to help us develop um, their plan for employment. So everyone's plan is different. Um, and it really just depends on what the person's job goal is, where they're at in life, basically. Like it's a lot different for a high school student than it would be somebody who maybe is older who is returning to work or, you know, or maybe had a job and, and is coming back to, D, you know, going to DVR to get a new job. Um, it really just depends on um, what all those factors include. And then, of course, including what the limitations are to employment. And so we can address those as well. Um, and that the plans are updated or reviewed every year because things change. So we want to make sure all the things are addressed and that the, the services on the plan are um, accurate. Um, I'm trying to remember. So um, I will pull that off, but I will just go through the rest of it a little bit. Um, and I'm switching over here. Go. Um, so their plan for employment happens and then we're providing those services, which I'll go over a little bit more specifically. Um, when somebody's working, there is a follow along and it's at minimum 
of 90 days, a minimum. So I, I you know, so it really depends um, on the person. So if somebody is going to need like long-term job coaching, it's going to most likely be beyond 90 days and that's totally fine, but it has to be at least 90 days before we'd be able to close somebody successful, successfully employed. Um, Otherwise, if it, you know, other reasons people would be closed, we're not being, we're not work, uh, not working would be if we can't contact them. Um, they change their mind, decide they don't want to work with DVR, they're not looking for a job. Um, or, you know, any other reason why they just, they're not, they're not going to progress towards their plan for employment, um, we would close their case. So I'm going to stop sharing that. So I'm going to close that and I'm going to show you. Um, so again, DVR, the main goal is to find a job, keep get keep a job or get a better job. Um, again, so, you know, it's based, the employment goals are going to be based on your individual strengths, priorities, abilities, interest, and informed choice. Now, especially with students, um, young adults, they may, you know, often not even know what they want to do for career or long term job and that's okay. And that's part of our um, job is to be able to help figure that out. The plan does require we put a job goal down, um, but we'll try our best to just come up with the best fit at that point, but we are always able to update it. Um, like I said, if, you know, part of the point is to try to figure that thing out, that out. So we may not know what the job goal is yet. Um, so um, that's something we will, I already went through this. Um, so, you know, with the plan, so this is the individual plan for employment or IPE. Um, we do have 90 days to write it. We try to, you know, really work as quickly as we possibly can to get that going. Um, but it does include the following things, which again, the job goal. Services that are needed to reach that job goal, progress measures. So what we're minor, you know, measuring to see how the services are working and how we're working towards that job goal. Um, potentially the service providers, like who's going to be providing, you know, the different services, um, the consumer's responsibilities and DVR's responsibilities. Um, and then, um, yeah, oh, sorry. So then I'm going to take this off for now because I want people to see me. Um, and one of the important things is that the services that are on the job, the IPE or the DVR plan um, need to be reasonable, necessary and appropriate. So it has to make sense. And, um, you know, it has to be something that's really needed to reach that job goal. And so that's a really when people are looking at like whether or not something should be approved or put on the plan that's a big thing we're looking at um and it also goes along with it everybody's different everyone's needs are different so what one person might be getting as a service may not be what somebody else is going to get or you know so it's not like a everybody gets the same thing um you know if one person talks and says well i know so and so is getting this and then i you know we should be getting this too it doesn't always really work that way a couple things that would be out of that exception would be any kind of job development or finding a job things like that i mean that's a main piece of what we do so pretty much it would be unusual for somebody not to have help getting a job um, things like that. But there's some specific things that may be very different depending on the person's needs, where one person might need it because of that specific job or, or their limitation where another person really doesn't need it or doesn't make sense to provide that. Um, everything is, again, centered around the ultimate goal of employment. So we do have to take that into account that it makes sense to help that person overcome any barriers um, that there are towards their employment goal. Do you guys cover things other than services like technology or things that might help someone um, be successful in the job or retain a job? What kind of things do you guys cover for that? Yeah, so when I, so services is a very general, I guess, term. So services could be, you know, like I said, job development, helping find a job, job coaching, things like that. Um, we also consider services like assistive technology, um, assistive uh, technology assessment and devices, um, 
it could be sometimes some it could be you know what maybe somebody hasn't been working and they've gotten this job but they need something for that job but they haven't been working so they don't have the funds to pay for whatever they need for a job whether it be uniform or some tools or something like that it could be even something like that we're overcoming any barriers um, we can provide or assist in funding transportation typically that's shorter term um, you know we want to the ultimate goal is that eventually at some point dbr is not going to be providing that or funding that we have to look at alternative sources or how somebody's going to continually you know um, be able to get to work but to start certainly we can provide um, like i said you know transportation um really vocational evaluation so if somebody's really like struggling with they don't know what they want to do the vocational evaluation might help with getting some more direction about um what kind of careers might or long-term goal jobs would be you know appropriate um DVR does the counselors themselves provide vocational guidance and counseling. So we are, you know, providing all that information. We are helping the person make their decisions and things like that and kind of guide in the right direction to help them make the decisions that will help them reach that job goal. Um, so there's, you really do have, um, there's many different um, services. There might be something that normally really nobody ever thinks about, but it could be for one specific person. It just might make sense only because it's their limitation or their job is that specific that they need something that maybe for what, you know, nobody else needs. Um, but typically other services that are pretty general would be, um, you know, even information and referral or like I said, the rehab technology vocational other training. So we can help with somebody going to college. We can help somebody with short-term training. We can help somebody with on-the-job training. Um, it really um, depends on, you know, like again, what their job goal is and what their needs are. So there's different levels of training. It doesn't have to be like formal college or anything like that. Um, and more often that we're, we're starting to try to get more programs where people have more exposure to um, kind of like on the job types of training. We've been working with um, different employers to set up a kind of train to work um, type things like, for example, FedEx. Um, they have, they'll take a group of people um, and do um, paid training for them to become a package handler, for example. Um, Walgreens is another employer that we've worked with to help people get their foot in the door and train on site as well. Um, but it could also be somebody who just one person specifically that may need some training on the job. Um, and we can work with that employer to do that. Um, sometimes it could be, you know, you need a license to do a certain job. OK, um, we can provide help with providing that or, like I said, tools. Sometimes a job might require tools that you know, like auto mechanics, a lot of times they have to come in with their own tools. Um, that's something we certainly can help with. Um, we can provide interpreting um, for all, you know, different things like that. Um, but those, I would say those are the mainly, the most common um, services, um, but they do, you know, like I said, there are very, sometimes very specific things that maybe are not very common, but are necessary um, to help them reach their job goal. But I would say the one thing is don't be afraid to ask. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say no. Um, and then, you know, that kind of lends me to jumping into um, appeals. So if, if you know, the consumer or their parents or guardian, whoever, maybe disagrees with what the counselor has decided, made a, you know, a decision on something, um, they always have the right to appeal that. And anytime they make a decision, you should have, not only when you get your plan, it'll have that in there, but there's always, usually any kind of decision will have what we call the, the appeal rights. And it'll outline like the process or like the steps you can do to appeal. Most likely, most people don't go beyond this, but generally it would be contacting the uh, local DVR supervisor um, and, and asking for, you know, this is decision that the counselor made and I don't agree with it and having them intervene um, and make a decision. There are other things that can be more of an informal hearing uh, or partial, sorry, uh, 
informal review, then it can be an actual hearing. Um, it doesn't happen very often. It does happen, but not very often um, when it gets to that point where there's that much like maybe disagreement on whether something should be provided. Um, but like I said, if you don't ask, you know, you don't know if that's something that we can help with or not. Um, let's see, any other questions? Anything I'm missing so far? Any specific questions anybody has? Um, if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself um, or you can put it in the chat box. Um, one question I, I know I've heard from families is that maybe they, their individual, their adult, um, based on their skills may not be able, there's maybe not a job that exists or that we know of, mm -hmm. right? That's gonna meet all the strengths that this person might have. Um, what are some options that families have through the DVR to, I don't know, job carving is the right word nowadays, but, um, <laughs> right, right. Yes. That is the, the old term. And it's really, I feel like sometimes there's not a better way to describe it. <laughs> um, but yes, I know what you mean. So where somebody may not fit, like, here's a position that's being listed and here's all the things that you're supposed to do or have to be able to do to be hired. And maybe that person can't meet all of them. They can meet all but one or something. You know, I had for an easy one to say is like where you know they want to work at a retail store, but they can't work the register. But the employer says, We're not hiring you for that, but you have to be able to do it in case we need you. Um, or it, you know, or maybe like, hey, there's a, they're really good at one or two tasks and they would, you know, be really beneficial. So certainly we're, you know, working with job developers and, and working with the employers and really um, talking about how that person could really be a benefit and to that employer. And then it's not necessarily that, you know, it, it benefits everyone um, to not just say, well, because you don't fit everything that we want you to be able to do, um, you know, we can't hire. And, and I would say, especially, you know, um, with COVID and everything and everything kind of changed, I think employers are a lot more willing to take people. Honestly, it's like, you know, if you show up every day and you do your job, you know, they'll work with you. Um, so we do work towards we knowing what maybe any kind of, you know, what the strengths are, the limitations are in, in approaching an employer, knowing that we are going to, you know, still promote that person to be working and maybe get, a you know, and, and just have a discussion about what, what could they do? Um, you know, can we modify the job to a certain extent where maybe we're moving uh, some tasks that maybe are not a good fit or maybe taking that job and saying, okay, maybe two different jobs and putting them together and kind of, you know, like I said, lack for a better word, carve it. So it makes sense to um, have that person do that. So there are definitely, you know, I never want to have somebody think like, well, you know, you look at a, at a job ad or you look at a, an opening and it says you have to have this, this, and this, you have to be able to do this, this, and this, and then say, well, forget it. I can't, you know, I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, certainly we can um, connect with the employer and see what other um, options we may have um, to work with them. And the more we are, you know, connect with employers and explain DVR, the much more willing they are to kind of work with us. And I, you know, I've been with DVR for almost 20 years and I feel like I've just seen it a lot more. Um, people are a lot more flexible. And certainly nowadays, I mean, the, the, the employers are, you know, totally ready to take people on that don't have the experience and they will train on site and they're totally fine with that. Um, like I said, their biggest thing is they want them to show up. They want somebody to actually be responsible and reliable and they'll do the training. Um, and so that we, you know, we're trying to get out to employers that we have a very good work population that is, you know, really going to be beneficial to their company. Um, if they just, you know, like I said, provide the training or whatnot. And so um, I think there's a chat right here. It just popped up. Um, Katie, I don't know if you want to read it or I can read it. I'm just reading the chat really quick here. Uh, 
Okay. Um, to, you know, I, I'm assuming that everyone can read that chat. I guess I'm, um, you know, I, I kind of listed some of the very general um, services. I think for me, I would say that um, as we're talking about what the needs are and what the um, types of jobs maybe we're looking at, um, personally myself would look at um, what specific for that person would make sense, I guess. Um, so, you know, that's how I kind of see it. Like I would say like, well, I know this is what their needs are. You know, this is some barriers. How are we gonna address those barriers? And that would be some of the services we'd use to provide that. Um, I mean, I do have, like I said, there's a very, it's a broad, I don't say broad list. It's not all encompassing services list right so i could i can provide certainly a list of dvr services like a most common services um but like i said there might be very specific things that aren't going to be thought of until it comes up and maybe as we're talking about like needs um or um uh, interest and in what kind of job it is and what is, you know, again, what is going to be needed for that specific job. Um, so it's, right. it's, it's really looking at the barriers and going, okay, what is going to help to overcome that barrier? So maybe it would help if you could provide that list to me, Anne, and I can certainly share it with the family, just the general services. Sure. Um, that might just help them understand. It's, I think part of the confusion is sometimes is learn, learning the jargon. I think, oh, you know, yes, yes. You and know, I like, am at fault for doing that too. That I just, <laughs> you say it so many times, and it's like you're talking in acronyms and, yes, right. the jargon. And, and, and yes, and it can get. And very, I think a lot of our families, they're getting jargon from long term care, they're getting jargon from DVR, they're getting jargon from school. And um, we don't all use the same <laughs> jargon necessarily. Um, when referencing it. And, you know, those of us who've been in the field for 20 some years, the jargons change, so we kind of don't always know the most recent ones if we've been out of the different areas of the field. So, um, yeah, if you could provide that, that'd be um, wonderful, and I can share that with the families sure. um, as well. Yeah. Um, Did your light so turn off, Ann? Oh, no. Can you hear me? I can hear you. It just looks like your light turned off. Oh. You're kind of in the shadows now. Very strange. You know what it is? It's because of like where my window is like. Oh, okay. The sun is setting and <laughs> got it. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Yep. And I, I always I know in another training where we talked about was Medicaid is thinking about what do you do if you're not there? Right? How is the person going to do the job task that maybe they're interested in if mom and dad and someone isn't there to prompt to, you know, what kind of um, training do they need? What kind of support do they need? Whether it's visual, auditory, whatever, what are those things that they need? And then, and do you just want to kind of touch upon um, what might also be helpful for families is what happens after someone is done with DVR. Let's say they get the, they luck out, you know, they're lucky, they get the job they want, they got the 90 days, mm -hmm. but there might still be some needs after 90 days. And, you know, we don't want to, we always talk about the cliff here at Journey 21. We, it's almost like a, you know, daunting cliff at 90 days of DVR. What happens next? And I'd say that's actually, to me, that's generally pretty short. Um, you know, and really, I would say, because for the most, for most people that I'm working with in general, like I feel like 90 days tends to apply more for somebody maybe who has been working for a long time, got a new job, and then they just need, you know what I mean, for whatever, and then they're, yeah. they're good. They don't need us anymore. It's 90 days, no right. problem, done. Um, so, and this is where it gets confusing, especially for younger adults who may be, whether they're in school or not. It gets confusing when it's like, okay, we're talking long, long-term job or something that, you know, 
at least in the near future, foreseeable future, is going to be what they're going to do for a while. Especially students, that might be three, four, five jobs before they get to that point. Um, and that's to me is normal. That's what most people like, you know, you're getting your entry level jobs, you're trying out different jobs, you're gaining work experience, and you'll ultimately you get a job, you're like, hey, I actually like, you know, I'm gonna stay here for a while. Um, so then there's, so we'll say we've gotten to that point where, hey, this is one that they're going to stay at. Um, so I would say majority of people I'm working with are well beyond the 90 days to begin with. This, you know, if they're, um, if they're receiving any kind of coaching, things like that, I'm not gonna say, well, hey, guess what? Your 90 days are up, you're out, like whatever, you know, you're on your own um, or that, that kind of cliff. So there's different things and it really depends on terms of, you kind of mentioned like Medicaid and like long-term supports. It really depends some on that. Um, if there's long-term support, so it's kind of braided. So if they're still in high school, it's high school overlaps with DVR. So DVR starts to come in while they're still in high school. And then they're out of high school, but DVR is still working with them. And they have a job and maybe we're providing what we call support. So support employment would be long, we consider like more intense job coaching, longer term job coaching, um, which in itself is more than 90 days. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, you certainly can get into it if, we, if you personally, like anybody has a, uh, a question about that. Again, throwing out those random words or those really weird words. Um, but basically the last thing we want is there to be a cutoff when then all of a sudden there's nothing, right? Um, so we want to make sure that that person's getting the services they need. Um, so if they're, you know, getting a job coach, the goal is to always decrease the amount of job coaching as much as possible. Some people are going to always be at hundred percent and that's what it is. If we can bring down that job coaching where it's more of natural supports, you know, um, and having like we call natural support, somebody on the job or things are set up so that person is able to be more independent on their job without having somebody there all the time. Um, and we want to bring it down as much as possible. So maybe it's just a check-in every once in a while, or maybe it's the beginning of every shift, the job coach is there. And then the rest of the shift, they're on their, their own, you know. Um, but depending on the situation, so if they have what we consider long-term support, so if they have like Medicaid, which then funds, um, you know, uh, family care, like, you know, community care, care with Scott, Iris. Iris, things like that. We would work with them. So DVR kind of like, it will eventually transition to that kind of funding. And that's when the person is like, hey, we are where we're going to be. We know exactly, we start talking about prior, but we, you know, we're, we are working with those other agencies. Um, but when it gets to that point of like, okay, this person is working this many amount hours, this is what they want, this makes sense. Uh, we kind of know what the needs are going to be pretty consistently, like where you kind of plateau, like it's pretty consistent of like, these are the services that they still need long term, like nothing shouldn't change, really, I mean, things come up, but in general, this is kind of where we're at, um, this is where they're at in terms of job coaching, for example, they're going to need five hours a week of job coaching. Then we would talk to, you know, the long term supports and they would hopefully be able to fund um, the continued job coaching once DVR is done. The intent is that the whoever's providing that job coaching is still the same. So that wouldn't be a change. It's just the funding source is a change. Um, and though when that actually and so once that's where another time the 90 days comes in actually is once that transitions over to the long term funding DVR still follows along for 90 days after it just to make sure nothing happens in the meantime that goes okay we need to do something or we need to provide another service or you know something happens that changes it so we want to make sure that everything is still okay once that changes so we're still following along for uh, 90 days after that as well. So we don't want to have that, you know, that cliff, that drop off of all of a sudden there's just nothing anymore. Um, and sometimes, so it could be that maybe down the road, they, if they're going to stay at the same job, but something changes and they need more than what has been allocated in terms of long-term, whatever long-term support can, can provide. And it's gone beyond that, or it's going to go beyond that again. And they need something to maintain, even though they have that long-term support, they can still come back and get more services from DVR. They could down the road be like, Hey, I want a different job. They can come back to DVR again and we can start over. Um, so it's, 
it's, you know, definitely we don't ever, like I said, don't want to have that where they're just having nothing. Right. Um, Absolutely. And I think um, for families, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ann, is helping families recognize you help the whole continuum of the job process, whether that's learning the interview skills, developing a resume, training, job placement and development, and then support on the job. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not just, you know, I want, you know, you mentioned like, you know, broader terms, but I want families to realize that it can be that granular mm -hmm. of services if that's what is determined a person needs in order to get the job and hold the job, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So really, it, like I said, it, it, there's, it's a lot, interestingly, it's a lot more gray than people really think it is. Um, there's a lot, it's, you know, it, there's a lot of things that can be done. And like I said, it really just depends on the person. Um, okay. So I'm just going to, I just saw this one that just popped up this. Um, yeah. So I'm going to read that and I, I have a rule. Okay. So it says told there was a hard limit to how many months DVR can provide services that are considered to be supported employment with a job coach lifetime limit. So even the concerns are already under the job pursuit. Once it's over, it's over. Um, that is actually completely not correct. Um, unfortunately, I mean, it is what it is and information, incorrect information comes out and, or it's straight out wrong, or maybe somebody misconstrued it, or maybe I don't, who knows what, um, and it does get confusing. And I'll say definitely, like, it sounds like you're talking, you know, support employment, support employment is really gray. People don't believe like how it is. People get nervous about it because it is, I, to me, so there are a lot of rules, but at the same time, I feel like it's a lot more flexible than people really know or understand that it is. Um, so there are specific things about the time limit for DVR. And when I say time limit, um, there really is no time limit. Um, and if somebody says there is, there really isn't. Um, I'm trying to think of how the best way to explain it. So say, um, somebody's uh, considered supported employment, so they're working, they have a job coach, and they're working under what they call supported employment with a job coach, okay? Um, generally, so I guess, you know, what I said is, it doesn't, as long as, you know, I have somebody who may be like, hey, we've restabilized really quick, and you know what, we can transition to long-term supports because they really, you know, it's pretty stable, we know what we're expecting, um, we can move forward. Um, they have to actually have, before transition can even happen, it has to be three months. Then it has to be three months from the transition. But there's no time limit really truly on how long somebody can be in supported employment before they're transitioned. And there's certainly no lifetime limit. Um, and then see the job is once it's over. But um, so it's never over. Um, there are, like I said, the very the, there's a few things, and those are and mainly those months um, when I talk about like three months or ninety days and and things like that are very they're almost more specific to rules for t transitioning for ourselves. So really, truly, the consumer should not see a difference in terms of services, right? So it's just a matter of funding. But there's certain things that DVR can do and can't do. Um, like, uh, like I said, so once it's transitioned over to long term, it has to be a minimum of 30, 90 days, it has to be. So there's no way to change that, right? But there's it doesn't have to be 90 days. It has to be at least 90 days, but for whatever reason, maybe it takes longer because something came up and now we have to change some things and, and, and add something else. We have to do some to tweak things. So I think sometimes people get stuck. They're like, well, once it's transitioned, it's transitioned. There's nothing you can do about it anymore. When there's a reason why we follow along. Um, so, but and once someone is discharged, let's say they go into supportive employment, they've been on it, we've gotten, let's say even six months, you know, but let's not even worry about 90 days, or it's six mm -hmm, months, mm -hmm. we reviewed, we're doing good, we think the person stabilized, they go over to their long term support, right? Six months later, event happens in individual's life, 
and something has changed and they now need support again. Really, the only thing that's changed is they just have to reapply for DVR services. Correct. So it's not, DVR maybe discharge them in order to, because with the long-term supports were taking over. Correct. However, DVR is still an option again. Yes. Yes. It just has to be reapplied for and go yes. through the process. Yes. Thank you, Katie, for, and I, because I'm like, I'm not, am I not? understanding some of the part of the question absolutely way back when it used to be that we called it like a uh i can't think of the word we were talking like but basically taking a closure reopening it we can't do that um but for all intents and purposes especially if if it's sooner rather than later i mean for me like I mean, we keep files for seven years where we can access them. So if somebody comes back, I mean, we could gr grab everything that's been there if it's been five years. We can still pull from that. If I had somebody, honestly, and I tell and I tell people this, and you know, like if somebody, you know, they can always reach out to me again and say, you know, you said something happens and okay, we need something from DVR again. I can help with your application. And really, if they've been in DVR and their stuff is still there, I mean. I'm personally not going to make them go through every single piece again when it's like, you know what I mean? Like reinventing the wheel. Like why do it again? Like it's right there. I I will speed for it. You might get somebody who's a little bit more stringent on it. Um, but it, exactly. It is a reapplication. Um, technically most people don't want to have to do extra work. So we should be able to pull everything from the old case with the eligibility and everything like that and put it right back in there. Um, like I said, we used to be able to do like a reopen, but that's not an option anymore, but certainly. So there's never, it could be, like I said, it could be like, hey, you know what? It's been a few months, but oh man, something came up and now we need a service. That's okay. They can reapply. Um, it could be five years. It could be whatever, you know, people can always come back. It, and if it's the same job, that's okay. So if it's something to maintain their job, that's absolutely okay to come back and reapply. If they want to get a new job, they can come reapply. But because they have the same job doesn't necessarily mean they can't come back if they need help with it. Or maybe they're in the same employer, but they want to advance and they need something to do that. Um, they can reapply. Um, so I, I don't ever want anybody to feel like they can't or that there's a time limit. And then like once you use up all your whatever, it's done. It's not. Um, so hopefully it kind of explain that correctly or understand in a way to be understood. Um, One service, and I just want, if you don't mind just mentioning it is, or explaining it a little bit. Um, we have families who are realizing, you know, their loved one gets a job. Um, they're now earning money. Sometimes them have two jobs. And suddenly their social security starts to drop. And obviously there's always concern of losing social security mm -hmm. um, when you begin working. So what can be yes. done? Yes. So hopefully um, I want to make sure, you know, and get that, you know, what we have, we can provide what's called the benefits analysis. Um, I was telling you, like I was telling Katie earlier, I can see that thing a million times and I don't get it. Um, it's very complicated, um, and all those rules and everything that the government has for that. But we do work with specialists, so we can make that referral. So um, certainly, by the time somebody starts working, I would want to say we're doing one of those assessments because then they can go through and gain the actual, they'll gather the actual specific information for that person, Social Security, um, what their benefits are, what their, you know, all the things that they're receiving. They will um, look at, so if somebody's already working, then they can actually take the specific information about that job, like how many hours they're working, what are the wages, and then calculate out, like, how is it going to affect the benefits? Because really, we do want to make sure that person is coming out ahead, regardless of, you know, if they're working, you don't want to work and then lose all your benefits, right? Mm -hmm. um, and especially keeping Medicaid. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to manage that. There's like, you can pay for it and it just goes right over my head. But um, we could, and it certainly definitely want to have that done by the time somebody has a job, because we really want to make sure that's all in place and that's understood like what, if any limits there are in terms of how many hours they should be working when they're not going to lose benefits, right? And there's different programs too, in terms of all the, um, Things like you can only have what two thousand dollars in your account. Um, 
you know, and all that stuff. There are ways around that and they can help you figure those things out as well. Um, and if they, certainly we can do it, we can, you know, before they start working, they can come up with hypotheticals about like, okay, well, what are you thinking? What do you think in hours um, wage? Why, you know, we can do some estimates and say like, here's what you want to stay under, or here's what, you know, if you're working this many hours a week, how much do you want to be, or, you know, that kind of thing and kind of getting an idea before you start working where the max is before you start to really see an effect. Yeah. Um, and, and I've had people who, yeah, and I've had people who maybe had that done and then they got a job and then it was a little bit different maybe. Um, and they can always go back and get re eval like they can look at it again. Um, right. things like that. Wonderful. We have, um, two more questions. Um, so I know, um, some of the providers, the service providers themselves have waiting lists. Mm -hmm. How was that? So of course the consumer's left waiting, right? Because what can you do? Does yeah. that affect their eligibility or the time they have available with the DVR? Nope, not at all. Okay. Um, again, there's no there's no um, time limit for working with DVR, and unfortunately, waiting lists for service providers is just the nature of of things. Unfortunately, um, it ebbs and flows, and um, we are trying to do better with really trying to keep on top of they started some new things in our system where we're supposed to be able to go and look and see if a provider has a wait. Like, so we know that when we're talking to families and stuff that maybe, you right. know, they have a wait, you know, this is what you're looking at. Um, still kind of working that out, uh, but it does not affect that person whatsoever. Um, it, it, you know, it would never affect eligibility, it would never affect the time limit. Like I said, unfortunately, it's just kind of the nature of things that, it, you know, sometimes they have the staffing might be low or there's just an influx of, you know, people coming to, to see them. I, I, you know, it really just, it depends. Um, like, you know, I mean, uh, like COVID, it was just crazy when that, you know, that came down and then there was, yeah. nobody was working. And, um, but certainly, and, you know, if they're on a waiting list, but the, I mean, if you really want to be with that provider and you're willing to wait, that's totally fine. If you feel like, you know what, I don't want to wait. I, I want them to wait that long. You can always ask for maybe a different provider that's um, more yeah, available. Question. Yeah. It, okay. um, but how certainly. Does, um, yeah. How does oh. the DVR fit with Ticket to Work? Oh, Ticket to Work. <laughs> um, this is terrible to say, but I will I will tell people, I'm like, don't worry about it. Just forget you even saw it. Um, so they like to write letters. Like you get a letter about Ticket to Work and it looks really scary. And it's a lot of words and I find it really frustrating because it like makes no sense and people are very confused and it sounds very threatening at times. I feel like um, ticket to work is basically an incentive, social security incentive to encourage people um, to work um, or to potentially maybe work and get off social security. So they're trying to convince people to work. And so that's the ticket. If a person is working with DVR, so they are a DVR consumer, their ticket is automatically assigned to DVR. So any of the rules that follow that ticket to work in terms of, um, I think one of them is like to continue, you know, to not have a review every so often or something, a disability review, you have to be working with a, a provider, uh, one of the networks or whatever, DVR, if they're working with DVR, their ticket is assigned to DVR. So you can kind of, I always say basically then disregard that ticket to work. Like there's nothing you have to do. It's an automatic thing. Um, if you're working, like I said, if you're working with DVR, you don't have to do anything at all. You can really just dis disregard the paperwork for it. It's automatic. The only time anybody would really ever even be involved in ticket to work would honestly be if they weren't working with DVR, but they needed some kind of assistance with employment um, down the road. But I would say I have never actually had anybody do that because I would say the only time I'd probably ever see that really would be if DVR had a waiting list. Um, and then people might have to go and say like, well, I'm going to use this other employment network in the meantime because I can't get DVR services. But since that's not the case, 
um, I know it sounds a little weird, but really you don't have to, to worry about it at all. If you're working with DVR, you're good. That's um, great. Yeah. We got another question. If disability application for social security and Medicaid ends up not being done until after DVR starts, so you already start DVR and now you're applying for social security and Medicaid, mm -hmm. does that hurt the consumer's eligibility for dis DVR services down the road? Nope. And does the DVR play a part in the means tested benefits application process? Uh, no. So I have plenty of people because I do work with students who are under 18 and they may not have gotten Social Security until they turn 18 or around then. Um, does not. Um, it does not affect it whatsoever. Um, they may. One only thing I can say if there's any kind of effect, it would be that. The, uh, the Social Security Administration or the Department of what is it, DDB or the Determination Bureau who does the eligibility for Social Security, they may request records from DVR um, as part of the eligibility. Um, so they will do that. It won't affect DVR in terms of eligibility for DVR. They could use the records from DVR to make help with their decision. Um, uh, but it's, you can certainly, I mean, obviously apply afterwards. So it, like I said, they might just, as a requesting, they may request records, you know, for a doctor, whatever, they may request um, records from um, DVR as well to see like, what have we been doing? Um, have they been working? Are they trying to work? Things like that. So they are going to, they might do that. Um, but it in no way ref it affects um, DVR services whatsoever. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, again, DVR would love to see people not, you know, being on Social Security, but realistically, that's often not a reality um, that can happen. Um, so it, it, it's just for me, it's like, I know how important, like, oftentimes Medicaid is for those long-term supports. So certainly I'm not going to, you know, I want the, the best to come out for that person. So um, it, it really doesn't um, it would never affect dvr um it just like i said they might gather some information from us great any other questions for um Anne? i keep getting son of my <laughs> doesn't appear to be any more questions um thank you everyone for joining us and thank you um, you're welcome we will, for those who are attending, we will get you um, the follow-up resources and get that to you. So, um, oh, I'm glad that it's been very helpful. So thank you already for the feedback, everyone. Um, yeah, have a fabulous evening and we'll be in touch. Yeah, great. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.